Hello and welcome to BBDC's online service. I'm Pastor Dan Ko, the pastor for seniors. No, I'm not the senior pastor for BBDC. Have you heard about the story from my seniors about COVID-19? We call it COVID-91, taken from Psalms 91, a promise of God's protection. It stands for Christ overcomes virus infection disease. Praise the Lord. I'm very excited now to tell you that there are two upcoming opportunities to learn more about Jesus in English and in Chinese. It's none other than the Alpha course. The Alpha is a comfortable, friendly setting where anyone can learn about Jesus and ask any questions you always wanted to ask about the faith. Now, next month, for the very first time, we will have running an Alpha online, the same comfortable, welcoming course, but now you can join it from the comfort of your own home. And not just in English, our friends at the Mandarin Worship will also host the Mandarin Alpha Online. So if you have friends or relatives who speak Mandarin, this is for them. And both courses will run from July to September. So dear friends, if you want to know more about Jesus, sign up to the link on your screen right now. Bibliotheans, I do hope that you are already thinking about who you can invite for the Alpha Online. Now, I got one more announcement. This coming Saturday, June 20th, our Bethesda Care Services will be hosting a Zoom webinar on coping with COVID-19, understanding its impact on the vulnerable within our community. Now, they have done a study on the needs of the poor and needy. And if you're asking, what more can I do to help those in need? Then sign up right now for this webinar. Now, that's our announcement for this week. Today, we have our beloved chairman, Elder Lok Viming, continuing on the study of the book of Colossians with a message about the centrality of Christ. So, church, are you ready? Let's worship and hear the word of the Lord. Hello, BBTC, and welcome to another online worship service. Let's prepare our hearts and let's give thanks to the Lord. Let's pray. Father Lord, we give thanks for yet another beautiful weekend, a time that we can come, we can gather over the internet to worship you corporately as one church. We give thanks that you are watching over us. Will you continue to lead us? Will you continue to sustain us? protect us and guide us and in our homes and among our families you are present with us so join our hearts right now together even as we come together with our spiritual family let's make a joyful noise unto your name and your name will be lifted high in our homes in our country this we pray in jesus name amen let's get ready to praise the lord let's go Stick is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your greatness, the oceans cry out to you, the mountains they bow down before you. So I join with the earth and I give my praise to you. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your greatness, the oceans cry out to you, the mountains they bow down before you. So I join with the earth and I'll sing the heavens declare.
Your name, O oh Lord. But there is no one like you, Lord. There is no one we deserve but you, O oh Lord. We worship you. children cry out unto you, O Lord. Be lifted up among our praises. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance. From my enemies Till all my fears are gone And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave songs of 
and daughters of yours, O Lord. You envelop us with your love. You surround us with your presence, O God. No, there is no one like you, O Lord. There is no one so wonderful as you. We worship you. We praise your name. For your plans are still to prosper us, and you, O Lord, will never forget us. You're with us in the fire. You're with us in the flood. Faithful God forever, blessed be your name. There is strength within the sorrow, there is beauty in our tears, and you meet us in our morning. With a love that cast out fear You are working in our waiting You're sanctifying us When beyond our understanding You are teaching us to trust your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood you're faithful forever perfect in love you are 
sovereign over us. You are wisdom and man. Who could understand your ways Reigning high above the heavens Reaching down in endless grace You're the lifter of the lowly Compassionate and kind You surround and you uphold me And your promises are my delight Your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood separate us oh what can separate us from this amazing love what can say it's greater than our God oh every knee will bow down oh every knee will bow down let's lift up the Lord we lift you high
Church, we now partake of the bread and the wine and we'll celebrate communion together. Wherever you may be, would you, together with the baptised members of your household, spend this sacred moment with the Lord, giving Him thanks for the emblems and for the Lord's sacrifice on the cross for all of us. Let us now give thanks for the bread. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Father, for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary for all of us. We thank you that His body was broken for our sins and He took our place upon that cross in order, Lord, this day that we may be forgiven of our sins. We give you thanks for this supreme sacrifice of love manifested by the Lord's death upon the cross and by His death we have life. And as we partake of this bread, which speaks of His body that was broken for our sins, we give you thanks and praise in His most precious name we pray. Amen. Church, let us partake of the bread together. Let us now give thanks for the wine. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we also thank you for the precious blood of our Lord Jesus which was shed for the remission of our sins. It is the perfect blood, the only blood that could wash away our sins. And today we thank you, dear Father, that as we come into your presence, Lord, we come boldly because we know, Father, that we are clothed by the righteousness of Christ and that our sins have been washed away. And this day, Lord, we stand spotless as we are hidden in the righteousness of Christ. So we thank you, Father, as we partake of this wine which speaks of His blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. That this day, Lord, our sins have been washed away and we stand clean, we stand cleansed, white as snow, because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. We give you thanks, we praise you. In His most precious name we pray. Amen. Church, let's partake of the wine together. We now bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord. And church, we do this as an act of sacrifice. We do this as an act of thanksgiving as we remember all that the Lord has given to us. And so may we participate in this offertory with praise, with thanksgiving, and indeed with joy for all that the Lord has done and given to us. Let us all pray as we take these offerings together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with so much. We thank you, Father, for your provisions of all that we ever can think or want or need. And we give you thanks, O God, that you have placed in our hands, upon our tables, and with our families, all the goodness, all the blessings, and abundance that you so freely give to all of us. And today, Father, we give but a little portion of what you have blessed us with. And so we ask, O Father, that you bless these gifts for the extension of your kingdom as we give it joyfully into your name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Church, the tithes uh, and offerings can be offered to the church in one of three ways, by checks, by bank transfer, or by pay now. And particulars are given on the screen before you. May we all give joyfully unto the Lord. Church, today we do part two of our four-part study on the book of Colossians. Um, Colossians uh, is a letter written by Paul uh, to the church at Colossae. And so let us just take a quick look at the location of this particular church. It is quite close uh, to the city of Laodicea, uh, which is perhaps a bigger and more important city and more familiar to Christians as the church described by the Lord in Revelation chapter 3 as being neither hot nor cold and therefore to be spat out. It is my hope today that in the course of this short study uh, that we will learn to be hot for the Lord, that we will learn to put Christ at the very centre of our lives. Let us all pray and ask the Lord to bless us uh, this time as we spend together looking to His Word in Colossians chapter 2. Let us pray. Father God, we just ask that you will teach us to put the Lord Jesus Christ at the very centre of our lives. That in spite of all the distractions, despite of all the wisdom of the world calling out to us, 
that we will learn to listen to the wisdom of God and learn to embrace the mystery of God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and learn to focus our eyes upon him and train our thoughts upon him and learn to live our lives centered upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and of revelation, teach us this day to focus upon Jesus, upon Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, and Him and Him alone. In His most precious name we pray. Amen. Church Colossae was not a particularly important nor a prosperous city, probably the least and the smallest city that Paul had written to. Problems were brewing in the church, problems that were serious enough to send Epaphras running over uh, to Paul to alert him to the problems that were taking place. This might be a small city church, but the problems there were getting larger and heresy was creeping into the church. Paul was alarmed. What was it about this smallish church and this small city, which Paul apparently did not plan and most likely did not visit, that would cause him to write this very important letter that holds great relevance to Christians even today? What was it about the heresy in Colossae that prompted such a stirring proclamation by Paul of the superiority and the supremacy of Christ and this extraordinary statement of rules for Christian living. You know, I want you to know that Paul had great feelings for the church in Colossae. And let us see what he wrote in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. He says this, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. And Paul probably had not even met many of the believers in the church. But he wrote this, as he said, his purpose was so that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. So the false prophet there were causing and teaching things which amounted to a heresy. And what was this heresy? This heresy was discouraging the believers. It was sowing discord and affecting the unity of the believers. And it was confusing the believers as to the mystery of the true riches of wisdom. And so it was doing and wreaking havoc within the church at Colossae. So what was this heresy and who was spreading it? Church's heresy has got two main components. First component of Gnosticism, which comes from the word Gnosis, which means knowledge, and the second component of syncretism, which refers to a mixture of different religions, practices, and cultures. Gnostics believe and assert exclusive access to direct revelation, which gives them a unique insight which is superior to all other Christian writings and beliefs. Now, this wisdom and this revelation is, however, not given to all. It's provided to them, the Gnostics, as knowledge to the true God. So the Gnostics were people in the know in relation to the things of God. And they were considered, or at least they presented themselves, as the spiritual aristocracy in the church. Now, at the heart of the Gnostics' belief is the key concept that matter was evil and corrupt, while the immaterial world was pure. So a pure and holy God could not have created the world because the world comprises matter. The material world, therefore, according to the Gnostics, had to be created by subordinate agents, and Christ was one such agent, according to them. Now, this was a serious heresy, and Paul had therefore to insist and to remind the believers at Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that Christ was the head above all creation. He is the head of the church, and he's above all angels. And in verse 16, Paul, in fact, reminded all that Christ was the creator. This was the message of the supremacy and the sovereignty of God, of Christ, which our brother, Pastor Jeff, spoke to us about last week. Now, like COVID-19, which is the topic of discussion now for many of us every day, 
the Colossian heresy was tricky and adaptive. It has Gnosticism joining forces with syncretism, a movement which makes Judaistic legalism, beliefs and practices. Now, just in case we all begin to think that syncretism required the purging of all Christian beliefs or Jewish customs, the heresy is actually much more subtle, much more seductive than that. It teaches that Christ alone wasn't enough, that Christian spirituality had to be supplemented or enhanced. And some of the recommended spiritual supplements referred to by Paul in Colossians chapter 2 uh, included these. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, Paul referred to religious and Jewish traditions which were taught uh, by uh, the false teachers. Uh, in verse 11, he said that uh, he referred to circumcision, uh, which was a very key Jewish religious practice. And the false teachers were saying that it was important to comply with key Jewish practices like circumcision. Uh, in verse 16, uh, Paul referred to uh, the requirement for dietary considerations, sabbatical and festival obs observations, uh, which uh, were important uh, uh, for the false teachers uh, to show an outward show of pious conduct. Uh, in verse 18, Paul referred to the worship of angels, uh, and such worship imports mysticism. It imports spiritualism. Uh, in verse 22, Paul talks about uh, the need for false humility uh, as taught by the false teachers. Uh, this taught that external posture is important. Um, and finally, in verse, uh, 20, verses 20 to 23, it talks about uh, the aesthetic, uh, ascetic practices and sacrifices uh, as exhorted by the false teachers. Now, now these, of course, provide uh, the evidence uh, externally uh, of an uh, internal um, uh, acceptance by uh, the, the false teachers. It talks about sacrifice. It talks about the denial of fleshly desires. It talks about disciplines uh, that are important uh, for uh, these believers. And, and so Paul was warning the church in Colossae, beware the need for these spiritual supplements to enhance or to add on or to complete what Christ had already done for us. And from these, the following features emerge, that primarily this heresy detracts from the person, the authority, and the work of Jesus Christ. It calls for human works to be supported by human philosophy and human traditions. And it affirms Jewish elements uh, and practices in order to affirm the outward appearance of conversion and of spiritualism and spirituality. Uh, it boasts a mix of mystery and of secrecy and superiority limited to a privileged few, and in this case, the Gnostics themselves. So this heresy encourages practices of deception and idolatry, but disguises this deception with a veneer of Christianity. These supplements do not endorse a departure from all the teachings of Christ, but they question the sufficiency of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they teach that Christians need more for their salvation than what Christ has done. Paul describes the people who taught these as puffed up, having unspiritual minds, and they have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. So which also suggests that these false teachers uh, were Christians insiders than people who were outside of the church. And what they taught and offered was only a Christian facade. The facade, why? Because it denies the supremacy of Christ and taught that He wasn't enough and that we needed spiritual supplements and reinforcements. Now, this is insidious because although it appears harmless, though this heresy does not deny Christ, it nonetheless dethrones Him. It displaces Christ from the center of our lives by teaching us that there is more to Jesus Christ and what He has done for us. And it reminds us of the warning by Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, of the dangers 
of practicing a form of godliness that is lacking in power. This is one of the devil's great weapons, to lure us into a state where we feel that we're not denying the Lordship of Christ, but in reality, we have indeed strayed to a point where He no longer reigns in our lives. This danger of assimilation of worldly practices into our faith is more real today, brothers and sisters, than ever before. In many ways, we are living in the age of syncretism. These days, societies and nations all over the world are trying to harmonize various schools of thought and religions to create value systems based on good morals, humanistic values, protecting individual choices, even taking the best from various religions and putting them into a religion of choice. The danger of such harmonization is that Christ will continue to have a place in the hearts of many, will be regarded as a great man of history, no doubt, will be regarded as a mighty prophet of God, one of the greatest teachers of all time, a man well ahead of his time. But also this new age values and beliefs will regard Christ as good, may be great, but not as God. Someone to be respected, but not to be worshipped. Against this backdrop, Paul's reminder to the church at Colossae that Christ is supreme is as powerful and relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. It bears reminding that Christ must be preeminent. And in first, um, Colossians chapter 1, in verses 15 to 18, and it's important to read this again and to see again what, Christ, what Paul said in relation to the supremacy of Christ, that he is the image of the invisible God. For by him, all things were created. He is before all things, and in him, all things consist. And he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, he may have the preeminence. Paul also says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, that in him is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. Now, it is important for Paul to refute the false teachings of the Gnostics that treasures of wisdom and of knowledge can be sought. But the Gnostics say they can be sought, but they can't be sought in Jesus Christ. They had to be sought in the knowledge or from the knowledge that they have been given. The Greek word Paul used for hidden in verse 3 was apokrufos, a word that the Gnostics knew too well as their knowledge was recorded in books called apokrufos. Paul wanted to tell them that the true knowledge and treasures of knowledge and of wisdom is not to be found in your apokrufos. They are apokrufos in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. They are hidden in Jesus. Paul wanted to emphasize the point that God's treasure of complete and true wisdom is to be found only in Christ and not in the books of knowledge of the Gnostics. Now today, the same deception I play, that the treasures to wisdom and knowledge may be found in sources that the, world's, that the world offers uh, through Google, through Wikipedia, through science, through the philosophies of the modern age. Paul's reminder to us is that Christ indeed is the mystery of God, the mystery of mysteries, the treasure of treasures, the gift of the gospel, the gift of Jesus, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of salvation, of joy, of peace, of righteousness, a God that is slow to anger, quick to forgive loves so deeply, loves so unconditionally. This is the mystery of God. These, this is the treasure that He has hidden in Jesus Christ. And as His children, we now have access to the riches and the treasures which are the truths of God. You know, friends, talking about access, today all important and sensitive information 
are stored in passwords and or by biometric recognition. But we know there are problems with modern technology. Um, we forget passwords. And if you're like me, we forget passwords very often, very frequently. Uh, biometric fingerprints uh, are sometimes uh, not recognized by the reader. I, I face this problem almost every Sunday when I try to get into the church office. I place my finger on the reader and somehow it doesn't read. I begin to think, do I have to place the finger a little bit higher, a little bit lower, maybe tilt it more to the left or to the right um, to get the thing to recognize my fingerprint. Such malfunctions, the good news, is that such malfunctions do not exist in our relationship with Christ. When we enter into a relationship with the Lord, we have direct access to our Lord Jesus Christ. He begins to transform us. The Bible says that we grow in Christ-likeness. Christ gives us a new identity which allows us immediate and full access to this treasure anytime, every time. It is to me a superior biometric access why? Because Christ never fails to recognize me. And Christ never fails to recognize any of his children. And Paul says that this mystery of God, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory, is the Christian's privilege to have and to share. In Colossians 1.27, this Christian glory, this Christian hope, is for us to have and to share. It is, however, one thing to know Christ. It is another to walk on with Him. Remember that false teachers were teaching that we needed more than what Christ could offer. We needed spiritual supplements in the form of knowledge, religious acts like circumcision, and human acts of abstinence, sacrifice, and false humility. Paul needed to teach the young believers why the richness of their lives depended solely upon their relationship with Christ without the need for any supplements. Becoming a Christian, friends, is a bit like falling in love. When we first met the Lord and invited Him into our life as Lord and Saviour, we are perhaps like the lame man in Acts chapter 3, who, when healed by the Lord through Peter and John, was recorded as being filled and overcome with joy, walking and leaping and praising God. And likewise, our first encounter with the Lord also probably changed us completely, filled our hearts with joy and our souls with hope and our entire being with love. If you would just take the time to recall, that feeling was wonderful. It is just like falling in love. But like a marriage, these feelings do not last all the time. Trials and challenges and issues and disappointments with God and misunderstandings with spouses and loved ones come in between. Prayers do not get answered on time. Prayers do not get answered all the time. Relationships fail. Health issues may surface. Financials are the struggle. And waiting for the job to come, for the interview to take place, for the promotion or the raise to be given, dealing with distractions, temptations, anxieties, big problems, small problems, imagined problems, they just won't go away. Is God lacking power or am I just lacking spiritual supplements? Is there something more that I needed to do? Now, Paul has the simple answer and he says this, Recorded at Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. In other words, you walk with Jesus the same way as you received Him. Just remember the first love that you had for Jesus. Remember how you fell in love with Him and gave your entire life to Him. The focus is not on how we receive Christ but rather on the walk with Him. The walk with Jesus, friends, is not a transaction. It is not a contract, but it describes a relationship with Him. The word walk is an ongoing, 
continuing process. And this frequently describes the Christian life. It isn't as impressive as running or galloping or sprinting, but it suggests a consistent, determined endeavour. Step by step, making progress towards a destination and a goal. And in verse 7, Paul uses three images to illustrate what this walk looks like to be rooted, built up, and established in the faith, just as we've been taught, abounding in thanksgiving. The first image, these are the three images, and the first image centers on the word rooted. It conveys the image of a tree. This is what many scholars refer to as the agricultural metaphor. Now, roots, we all know, have got two main functions. Firstly, it holds the tree to the ground. The root system fails, the tree falls. Secondly, it takes in water and nutrients from the ground. No other part of the tree absorbs water and nutrients. And whilst other systems in the tree are also important for the survival of the tree, nothing else in the tree is given the responsibility and the ability to hold this tree to the ground, to seek out water and nutrition in order to keep that tree alive. So the question I ask today, brothers and sisters, is what is anchoring your life and what is holding it up? What is feeding your hopes and who or what is keeping you alive? When storms and floods descend upon your life, what would be supporting and holding you up? In your periods of spiritual dryness, when doubts and anxieties envelop you and bring despair, what will feed and nourish you? My encouragement to all of us, be rooted in Christ. He alone is sufficient. Just as the seed which fell on good soil and is not choked by the anxieties and by the troubles of the world or by the cares of the world, and it takes root, just like the tree in Psalm chapter 1, verse 3, that's planted by the waterside, that bears fruit in season, whose leaves never wither, Paul says, take root. And what does this mean, brothers and sisters? It means to explore the faith. It means to read and to search the Word to cultivate the discipline of prayer and devoting time to intercession. Like the roots of a tree which cannot be seen, these disciplines too are unseen, but they are crucial to our grounding in the faith and to the nourishment of our spirit. And do we do this not so that we can score points with God, but so that we can grow in this relationship with Christ. The second image centers on the word built up. It conveys the image of a building. This is referred to as the architectural metaphor. Right now, we are working on an extension to our existing uh, block of the church, which houses our halls one and hall two. And we call this the Genesis block. And why? Because we need to cater. Uh, to a growing congregation that needs more space uh, for more rooms, for cell meetings, for prayer meetings, for ministry meetings, for seniors activities, for Bible study, uh, for teaching, for daycare student centres, for our kindergarten, and the list of needs goes on and on. But a building isn't put up overnight. We have been planning this rebuilding for months. The beauty of a building is the result of months of preparation and careful planning. When you are upgrading a building, making progress to an existing building to make it better, like what we are planning now, the work and the preparation is even more challenging. You need exact calculations to make sure that the new building will join up perfectly with the old building. 
you need to make sure that the new wall of the new building will join seamlessly to the wall in the old building, that the levels in the new building will lead into the levels of the old building without anyone stumbling or tripping over. So when the new and old buildings are done, that the walls and the levels will meet seamlessly and perfectly when they are completed. Now, for all of these things, you need a great design team. And we thank the Lord we have excellent architects and talented design people in our midst to help us in this rebuilding exercise. Now, similarly, when we are building and rebuilding our lives, the Lord is a great designer at work. He knows our frame. He knows the strength of our foundation. He knows our capabilities and our abilities. He knows the talents that we have and the limitations that we struggle under. And he will set about to work in our lives like a potter working the clay, like the skilled worker refining the gold. To do what? To create that masterpiece that Paul describes all of us to be in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, created in Christ to do good works as he prepared us in advance to do. Now, alas, there are many buildings that we see around that are incomplete, left in disrepair, and abandoned. Now, what happened? Let me tell you. Wrong builder, wrong designer. So if I may ask you, what building are you putting up with your life today? And who is building it? Get the master builder. Trust Christ and him alone, and let him build your life. The third image centers on the word established. This is a little bit more complex. The word established means, one, something that is set up on a firm or permanent basis. For example, you walk into a shop and they tell you that we have been selling this tea uh, for 50 years. Uh, since 1969 or 1970. And so you have this shop selling the best teas in Singapore, established 1970. And so that becomes uh, an established fact uh, that over time, uh, this place or this business uh, had that reputation. Or it could mean something that have existed for a long time uh, and is therefore recognised uh, for what it holds. For instance, uh, the core value of BBTC, the three Cs, that there is no competition, there is no condemnation, and there is no comparison. And over time, this becomes the established uh, core value of the church. And so it is something uh, that we believe in and something that all BBTCians associate with. Or thirdly, it is something that's shown on the facts to be certain, to be correct, to be correct, or to be assured. For example, you want to know if A and B are married. And so when you see the marriage certificate and that they are husbands and wives married at a certain date, at a certain place, in a certain year, you now know for a fact, because it's backed up by evidence, that A and B are indeed a married couple. Now, scholars refer to this as the legal metaphor. The life that we have in Jesus it's a life that is based on an assurance, one that is backed up by evidence that God loves us and that Christ is the personification of that love. And we have the assurance of God, who is the promise keeper, that He cares for us. The treasures in Christ are the treasures that He's making accessible to us. That this comes from the lips of a promise keeping God, the same God who says, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, that no one is able to pluck us out from his hands, that those who come to him will never be cast out. This same God is promising us that I will keep my promises. That's my word and my guarantee. And our faith will be fully established by God's promises and we do not need any supplementary assurances from our own actions or from the guarantee of others. God's assurances do not depend on, nor are they conditional upon, our promises to love Him first 
or to be obedient to Him. He loves us regardless of our faults. Just as He saved us while we were yet sinners, we need no more than to know that. We need to live our lives established upon the truth that God loves us, Christ died for our salvation, and that Christ alone, without my help or work or sacrifice, is sufficient for me to live a life that will bear fruit in every good work. May I then ask you today, my friends, what is it that you have established your life on? That hard work is the way to go? That good connections is the catalyst that we need to make something out of this life? Or that perhaps through good luck and karma, we get the break that we've been waiting for a long time? My friends, just as we have learned to put our hard-earned money and invest them with big companies and established banks, would you determine to fully invest your lives today with the Creator Himself? Put your hope in Him. Find out more about the promises of God and what these promises are. And as your faith continues to be established and assured in Him, claim those promises. Our God is a promise-keeping God. Paul rounds these instructions with the exhortation to be overflowing with thanksgiving. Dear friends, a life well lived in the Lord is not an accomplishment, not an achievement, but I consider it a blessing because such a life will reap rewards in the course of living it. When we are conscious of the Lord's leading, and His guiding and His loving. We can only respond with gratitude and with thanksgiving. It is hence not surprising that Paul also exhorted this in 1 Thessalonians 5.16 to be thankful always. There is a simple truth in this and I have discovered it for myself. When we do something out of a duty that is owed, we try to look for ways, now without getting ourselves into trouble, we try to look for ways to avoid doing it. But when we do something out of gratitude, because we are so thankful, we actually do look forward to doing that thing and often with even greater joy and satisfaction, the more difficult it is to do it. Think of a person you love and see if this is true to yourself. And perhaps... The translated version of Colossians 2, 6 and 7 in the message aptly sums this up. My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you have been given. You receive Christ Jesus, the Master. Now, live Him. You are deeply rooted in Him. You are well constructed upon Him. You know your way around the faith. Now, do what you have been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living it, and let your living spill into thanksgiving. In conclusion, my friends, beware the syncretistic dangers of today's philosophies, religions, practices, and the dangers of compromise and tolerance. Christ alone is sufficient for your salvation, for your faith, and for your life. Nothing more is needed. The treasures are hidden in Christ. It is for you to enter in the true, vibrant, living relationship with Him to access them. Beware the dangers of ascetism and legalism. Beware the need to try to do something more to sacrifice yourself. Beware the need for you to do something more to prove yourself to the Lord Jesus or to society at large. The problem with all of these is that they impose obligations and traditions. They are nothing more than just religions that is imposed and self-satisfying. Christ has already done everything that we need for life and for salvation. There is nothing more 
that we can do to add to that. I'd like now to invite all of us to just watch this short clip on the show Saving Pri Private Ryan. Some of us, in fact, I think maybe many of us, we have seen this movie about the life of Private James Ryan in World War II. His brothers were killed during battle, and the army then rushed out the mission to save the last remaining brother. They sent Captain Miller to locate James Ryan and to bring him back to safety. Private Ryan was found and rescued, but in the process, Captain Miller and indeed almost the entire squad who went in search for and to rescue him lost their lives. Captain Miller's dying words to Private Ryan on the bridge were this, James, earn this, earn it. Years later, Private Ryan settled down, got married, started a family. In the closing scene of the movie, Private Ryan, now an old man, blessed with a family together with his wife, children and grandchildren, paid tribute at the grave of Captain Miller, the man who gave his life in order that Private Ryan could have his. Let's just watch this clip of the closing scene of Saving Private Ryan. Saint Marshal, General, Chief of Staff. with you, I, I wasn't sure how I'd feel coming back here. Every day, I think about what you said to me that day on the bridge. I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. I hope that at least in your eyes, I've earned what all of you have done for me. James, Captain John H. Miller. Tell me I've led a good life. What? Tell me I'm a good man.
My friends, have we been living our lives, paying off our debts just so that we could justify our own existence? I know, many of us know, that we do not and we cannot earn our salvation. Yet, practically and daily, in matters big and small, we are living every day trying to earn it and to live up to it, wondering whether our lives are good enough for God. And I can tell you that that would be a totally futile way to live our Christian lives. If it is spent in pursuit of the payment of a debt which never existed in the first place, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, God doesn't need us to do any more for Him, but He would like us to love Him more. We have to learn to put Jesus at the very center of our lives. And remember this God had no plan B besides Jesus when He set out to save us. Likewise, we should have no plan B besides Him when we live this life. Shall we all pray? And today I'd like to pray for two groups of people who may be listening in to this message. The first group are for those of us, those of you who might be listening in, and you are still strangers to the love of Jesus Christ. You want to know more about this mystery of God, this Jesus himself. But something tells you today that your life is incomplete without him. Your life is about chasing shadows, paying off debts which you think you owed, trying to earn it and make your life worthy for someone else. And you want this to end. And you want to know this Jesus and invite him into your life. If that is you, I would like to say a prayer. And you can say this prayer after me and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, I thank you that you love me so much. I thank you that it is the mystery of God that you love a sinner like me so much, so freely and so deeply that you will send your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. I admit and confess this day that I am a sinner and that I will be lost without Jesus. And so I now open my life and invite Jesus into my heart and into my life to be my Lord and my Saviour, to forgive me the sins which I've committed and to accept me and bring me into his family. And so I ask you, dear God, that you will accept me as your child, to love me and for me, Lord, to love you and to have you forever. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. The next group of people I'd like to pray for will be for those who might have been thinking, am I worthy of God? Can I do more and should I do more? Brothers and sisters, this is the time to stop thinking about how much more you can do for your own salvation and for your life, but to think more about how you can live this life with Jesus by putting Him at the centre of your life and by trusting Him to show you the full riches of the treasures that the Lord has given to all of us who love Him. And if that is you, I'd like you to pray with me this prayer. My gracious God and Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving me so much. And as I think back, O oh Father, over the years, to the day where you came, the Lord Jesus Christ came into my life as Lord and Saviour. Oh, what love filled my heart. What joy filled my life. And I pray, Father, Lord, 
that just as I received the Lord Jesus, that I may walk in Him victoriously, joyfully, and with every expectation that I will be that salt and light that you ask me to be. So help me, O Father, to be rooted in Christ, built up in Him, and established in your love with confidence and every confidence, dear God, that you love me and you will never leave nor forsake me. Teach me to put Jesus as at the very centre of my life, to worship Him and Him alone. In His most precious name I pray. Amen. Thank you. The Lord bless us all. In Christ alone I place my trust And find my glory in the power that we can gather on this online platform to learn of your word and to worship you. And even as we go forth, help us to walk with the Lord. Help us to trust in you. Help us to know that you are a source of strength. You are a source of hope in you and only in the Christ that we believe in, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. So we look forward to another new week ahead with you, walking with you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us. We hope you encountered the presence of God. I believe there are some of you out there who have been ministered to by the Word and worship today. If you are watching this on Saturday evening or Sunday morning, we have prayer intercessors waiting to pray over you on our Breakthrough House Zoom. Join in by typing the link on your screen. So God bless you and see you next week.